Carl Rove served with Colin Powell in the Bush administration as the president's senior advisor. He is also a Fox News contributor, of course. Carl, good to have you with us. You uh, and uh, General Powell worked together there from 2001 to 2005, I believe was the time frame. Uh, your thoughts on this really surprising news that we all saw uh, across the wire this morning. Well, it's a sad day. Uh, this was a remarkable human being who led a great life. And uh, his memoir is entitled An American Journey. And it was an American journey, uh, uh, born to uh, immigrants, first generation American, um, sort of wasn't finding his way in college, was an engineering major, dropped that for geology, and then uh, ended up uh, finding his, his home, so to speak, by joining the ROTC. And uh, Rose, a combat veteran uh, of Vietnam, White House fellow, uh, national security advisor to President uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, 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 named by George H.W. Bush as the youngest chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and then became the first African American Secretary of State in 2001 under George W. Bush, incidentally, making him until Barack Obama's election in 2008 the highest ranking African American in our government ever. And um, he had great integrity. He loved this country deeply. He loved the American military. Uh, he was a brilliant man who um, brought all that he could to the service of our country. I, I think it's an interesting point in his memoir. Uh, he wrote, I have led a great life. Mm. And he had, and yeah. he has. He certainly had. Um, and you recount his rise it, very, very well, Carl. I know you guys had a personal relationship as well. He thought, you know, you're the political guy at the White House. And at times you had uh, sort of different approaches to things. Uh, give us a little sense of, of your personal relationship. Well, I could know when he was irritated with me. And I, look, I, I very rarely got into his, in, into his lane, but occasionally I had to sign off on appointments. And uh, he once recommended somebody who, while they might have been suited from, the, from their background, uh, had nonetheless denounced the president of the United States as being an idiot after the election, not just simply before the election. And so I, I raised objections to it. And I could tell when General Powell, uh, Secretary Powell, had, was irritated with me because when he would come into the Oval Office or see me in the hallways, of uh, the West Wing, he'd bark at me, drop and give me 20 soldiers. So one time we were in this discussion about about this potential nominee, and he knew I was blocking it. So I happened to be coming out of the Oval Office, and he happened to be coming in. The president had uh, something else he needed to do for a couple of minutes, so I was supposed to keep him company. And he barked at me as soon as he saw me drop and give me 20. Well, I was just irritated enough that I dropped and gave him 20. And as luck would have it, you know, he, 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 was, not, he was hoping I was not going to be able to do it. So he literally got down on his knees and put his fist on underneath my chest. So I had to bump off his fist. Oh. And he was just hoping I wouldn't do it. And as luck would have it, the White House photographer came cruising in the office at that moment. So I have the photograph of me finishing my 20 push-ups at the direction of, uh, of Secretary Powell. That was the last time he ever said to me, drop and give me 20, soldier. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, we're, we're not able to get it up on screen, unfortunately, but I've seen the picture and I hope everybody will get a chance to see it. It's a, it's a great photo. Um, and he, yeah, he's down there on the ground underneath your chin, making sure that you, um, that you're doing those, those 20, very impressive, Carl, uh, 20 push-ups in the Oval Office. You know, I, I do want to play this because I read um, in some of, of General Powell's writings, he said that he believed that it would be a, a prominent paragraph in his obituary, what happened at, with his U.N. testimony. And he spoke openly about regretting that testimony on WMD later in his life. Here's just a little bit of, of that uh, at the United Nations back in 03. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. What are your thoughts on all of that, Carl, today? Well, uh, look, it's natural to have a regret about it. This is what we knew at the time, what he knew at the time, what the world community knew at the time. And part of the reason that we felt that he had, that Saddam Hussein had at WMD was because he wanted us to know that. He thought that the, that the image of him having WMD kept him safe at home, that it discouraged his, his uh, uh, enemies in the region from attacking him, that it kept us out of, uh, his, uh, out of him. And remember, 14 resolutions of the United Nations had been passed 
arrest, uh, demanding that he live up to the terms of the surrender agreement and make accounting for all that material, and he thumbed his nose at the world community. So that's what we knew. But in retrospect, it turned out not to be true. Now, granted, he was waiting for the moment that he thought the West would lose interest. He was taking money out of the oil for food program. He was diverting that to keep together the network of experts and scientists and, and uh, infrastructure to reconstitute these programs at the earliest available moment. But if you look, if we had known that it was not accurate, we would have found other ways to constrain him. And I think the secretary felt very, particularly coming from the military background that he did, he felt very strongly about that. And, and, uh, and, and look, I, I understand the sense of regret because if we'd, if we'd known what the real truth was, we wouldn't have taken the actions we did. We would have found other ways to constrain him. Uh, I don't know if you remember your, your last interaction uh, with Colin Powell. He, he pulled away from your party uh, over the last several years, voted for, um, voted against John McCain, voted uh, against uh, President Trump. Uh, your thoughts on, on that part of his story? He said he didn't belong to either party in a not so long ago interview. Yeah. No, he, he, uh, he had become disenchanted with the drift of the Republican Party, but mm -hmm. you know what? You could still have cordial relationships with him. I saw him at a, at a lunch at uh, Vernon Jordan's house uh, in Washington, D.C. He had a wonderful visit with him. By accident, ran into him of all places at the airport in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I was giving a speech, and he was coming back from, from I think, a short vacation. Uh, and uh, he, he, this was a man who always had a smile on his face, uh, when, when he greeted a friend and who uh, d d you could have disagreements with him, but he didn't take it personally. And uh, that was the way he was. He came out of the military. He came from little. He talks about in his memoir very movingly about having grown up in relative modesty. He had a gang. He had a gang. His gang was two blacks, two Lithuanians, and one Puerto Rican. And those were the, those were the young kids that he ran around the Bronx with. And, and he lived essentially the American dream. And how can you not be optimistic yeah. and upbeat if you've come from the relative poverty of his youth and, go, and gone to the highest levels of our government and service to our country? He delighted in the fact that he was a soldier. And he delighted in the fact that he came not from West Point, but that he came through the R uh, ROTC unit at the City College of New York and rose to the highest yeah. rank in the United States military. That, that for him, was an expression of what yeah. America was about. Absolutely. And in the post-Vietnam period, uh, when he rose to leadership, he really, I think, elevated a new respect for the military that had disintegrated dramatically in this country. And I heard someone say earlier today that whenever he had the opportunity in his leadership positions, he always made sure that people got to speak to the members of the military directly so that they could see for themselves what incredible young men and women they were and are. And I think that is, you know, such a huge point to his credit as well, uh, that he was humanized the military uh, and elevated them in the American uh, in the American mindset in a way that that really took a beating uh, after Vietnam. Carl, thank you very yeah. much. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Well you said. You bet.